Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dropping the Gloves. Thanks for joining us here. October 1, Tim. Can you believe it? Can you believe in October 1st? How are you doing over there in North Carolina, Tim? I'm doing good. The weather's getting a little bit cooler, even though it's still pretty hot. I'm, uh, I've been missing the Michigan, New England cooler weather a lot lately. Um, but we're starting to see it a little bit here, too, which is nice. Yeah. How is the um, – I didn't North Carolina get really hit? with that hurricane because i've been seeing the news articles and stuff and it's like it's scary tim how close did that come to you yeah we definitely got some of it in charlotte um but if you saw like the weather map we were just right in the edge of like the heavy stuff so we just got some rain there's a lot of down uh trees like huge ones big like you know 200 year old trees but um it was just rain really and and some wind but everything else is like an hour two hours west of me like Asheville is the one that was hit the worst um, which is crazy because it's up in the mountains. It's like hours and you know from a, from a the ocean water source. Um, so it's crazy, and they were so unexpected. They were so un- not ready. Oh no! So all the businesses here are like rallying to send food and money and water, and the water system shut off out there. It's just really scary. Um, a few of my buddies are making you know little day trips out there to bring just supplies and stuff. So yeah, really scary. But uh, I'm okay. We're okay here. All right, nice. That's scary stuff. Well, I guess we'll move on. We'll try to, but yeah, that's that's crazy. I'm glad you're okay. All right, you know who's not okay? Kind of a weird transition, but we're going to get into it. Um, Cam Neely and Jeremy Swayman. Now, you you talk about ways to negotiate. If if you're a president, as T- Cam Neely in, is, Don Sweeney is the GM, you have a strategy at the beginning of the season. You know, the end of the season ended last year, obviously, and you're, you're going into 24-25. Who was our goaltenders? How are we going to do this? We can't continue to roll out Allmark and Swayman. If you were to ask any GM in the league, which goaltending situation do you admire the most? Which situation are you a little jealous of? I would say most GMs would go the Bruins at the end of last season. Gosh, they have an all-star in Linus Allmark. They have a a future all-star in Jeremy Swayman. Both goaltenders seem to love each other. You know, there's no infighting. I want to be the starter. I want to be the guy. They both understand their their position. Fast forward to now. How do we go from that situation, Tim? Complete homogeny. Everybody was just loving life. You know, obviously the playoffs didn't play out the way we wanted them to. Jeremy Swayman stood on his head. It was a great situation in the net. We got some work to do up front. We need some firepower. We need a centerman. We need some help on the back end. They did that. And now what was your biggest strength is in complete chaos. How does that happen, Tim? You're a marketing guy. You negotiate with clients. How did we get to this point? Yeah, the short answer is we don't really know. I mean, obviously, so much of this is behind closed doors between um, Neely and, and Swayman and his agent and all that. But it's it's tough because there are parts of that are, uh, of being a hockey fan where you feel embarrassed for the city and, and the team or whatever. And most of it's hockey related, right? Like you you blow a three nothing seriously, whatever. You you kind of become the butt of a joke. And there's also like the the franchise embarrassments organizational embarrassments that aren't necessarily on the ice but stuff like this and yesterday was one of them some of them are personnel related this is one of those things where it's like they both look terrible neely looks like a jerk swayman looks like a jerk his agent looks like a jerk and we'll get into all the details but i don't know how we got here we kind of trace back to you know the starting with arbitration last year and you know we talked about all of it but Yesterday, Cam Neely, uh, along with the rest of the, the leadership of the organization, spoke at a media event, and, and obviously Neely was asked about the negotiation, and, and he just, they were kind of asked, like, can you share anything about the details and the numbers and where, where it's at right now? And Neely said, you know, he said, quote, I can think of 64 million reasons why I'd be playing right now. So he's saying to the world, hey, we've offered him eight by eight or one by 64, right? So we're like, we've offered him the money. The fact that he's not in the ice is, is his fault. It's not ours. We've acted in good faith. Now, I'll add a couple of things to that. First, as we've said, Swayman's sample size is still relatively small compared to most of the other goalies that are getting paid this amount of money. He's played 132 games. He's played all of those games behind one of the best defenses in the league. He's played just about all of those games, splitting time with 
a Vezina can a Vezina Trophy winner. You know, so he's had a lot of things going in his favor, which the Bruins are using in their negotiation. But all that aside, he's played outstanding, especially in the playoffs last year. He's got that that psycho goalie attitude that you want that, you know, lives up to the big moments. So that eight by eight would put him around the fifth highest paid goaltender, which is about right. Right. Especially considering the fact that he's the one that's negotiating now. He's not a top three goalie, but he's a top five, top eight. Right. So that number sounds about right. And the Bruins never reveal information like this. So the fact that they did tells you that this whole narrative at this point about the Bruins not returning his calls, lowballing him, is not true. Sweeney's saying, hey, listen, Neely's saying, listen, we offer him the money. He's not taking it. So it's flipping the narrative right away. Kind of a jerk, ugly way to do it. But at this point, when this was released yesterday afternoon, and everyone's sort of like, you know what? The Bruins offered him hint this. We're team Neely now. We're team Bruins. Swayman is either getting duped by his agent or he's asking for too much. Um, they flipped everything completely in an instant. But that didn't last long, did it, John? Well, why, my question is, why is everybody so concerned about their public kind of image? Because this is what it seems to be. This is what's happening. Do you think... Cam Neely and Don Sweeney think that by stating what they have supposedly offered, $64 million, and everybody agrees it's eight years, $8 million, do you think their reason – because there's a reason for everything. This was calculated. He doesn't just go out and say this you know, off the cuff, and it's not a mistake. They talked about this before the press conference, and they agreed that this is what he's going to say. Do you think this was going to pressure – Jeremy Swayman and Lewis Gross to sign this contract because I'm assuming Swayman wants to set the market. And at this point, the market is $10 million. Bobrovsky, Vasilevsky makes nine, five Carey price, I think is an outlier where no one's looking at that, but I'm assuming he wants to be in Vasilevsky Bobrovsky range by saying eight years, 8 million in a press conference. When the season is around the corner, this is the biggest story in hockey right now. Do you think, put yourself in their shoes, does you think this helps the negotiation because it puts pressure on Jeremy Swayman? Do you think he's all of a sudden going to go, oh, people are going to feel a certain way about me, I should sign? No, it, it, it doesn't help anyone, especially it was done in that cheeky, sarcastic way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's the part that I don't love. And, and this is the part where it kind of gets embarrassing to be a Bruins fan, like this sort of thing. The fact that we're in the situation at all is just so strange and bizarre to me. And the way that this is being handled really by all sides, um, because like I said, for there was like a two hour window yesterday where everyone's like, hey, listen, Swayman is the bad guy now. He should have signed. This is a more than fair deal. You don't get to set the market when you haven't played as many games as some of the other guys have. Like, I understand why he wants to, but eight by eight is more than fair. He should be signing. He should be playing. Let's move on until... Swayman's agent yesterday released <sighs> his own statement. And this is where and it I gets think, messy. I think Swayman or someone in Swayman's camp is using chiclets as uh, an outlet. Um, a lot of stuff is broken through them, including Biz tweeting out like an hour before this broke out. You, you can expect a response from Swayman's agent. So like they're using they're using the plan. Yeah. And rightfully so. I mean, Ch chiclets is the behemoth. And yes, they're very much a players uh, friendly podcast. So. Lewis Gross, who represents Jeremy Swayman, released a statement yesterday. He said, quote, normally I do not release statements or discuss negotiations through the media. However, in this case, I feel I need to defend, defend my client. At yesterday's press conference, $64 million was referenced. This was the first time that number was discussed in our negotiations. Prior to the press conference, no offer was made reaching that level. We are extremely disappointed. This is not fair to Jeremy. We will take a few days to discuss where we go from here. So... The main message is like, hey, he's hinting this number. We never got it. But the yeah. biggest part of this is the end. We will take a few days to discuss where we go from here. So now at this point, hockey Twitter is blowing up. Everyone's overreacting. Everyone's saying, you know, just adding fuel to the fire or whatever. But Elliot Friedman last night put out an article on Sportsnet. And he basically said that Neely and the Bruins camp were very, um, I forget the word that he used, but let's just say not happy with the... <laughs> Swayman's remarks about wanting to set the market. Um, and, and Friedman said, after this, 
this little uh, remark from from uh, Neely that speculation ran rampant that Swayman would formally ask for a trade. The statement reveals one obvious truth. He is considering it. So we are entering the phase of the negotiations where Swayman is considering a trade formally. And he wants to be a Bruin. The Bruins want and need him to sign. And the fact that we're here is so frustrating and embarrassing. And I'm, I just, I don't know how we got here. Yeah. Well, it all started back in arbitration two years ago when Jeremy wanted a deal then, but the Bruins had the luxury of having Linus Allmark and a kid under an ELC who they have total control over. And they took him to arbitration and we had Jeremy on the show. And like you saw in that radio interview we did a couple months ago, he's, he's a very just thoughtful guy. And he really does take in what you say about him. And he, he, you know, mulls it over and he gives you a response and he's just, he's a good guy. And during that arbitration hearing, you know, things were said and those things lingered and you could tell it's still, those things were with him when we talked to him last year, it it left a wound and fast forward to now where he's in the same situation, he's negotiating a contract, but he has all the leverage. He's the one who he's a starter. They traded line of Solmark. He's going to be a UFA after this season. He just came off a fantastic playoff run where he was arguably the best player on the ice. So he has all the cards in his favor. The fans are behind him. Everybody's putting pressure on the Bruins. So the Bruins have to do something to sway the negotiations. And they say this, this is the second time essentially they've came at his character and they came at him one in the arbitration hearing. And now two now he's got some conviction, Jeremy Swayman. Do you think this is going to thwart him or make him back down? The one sense I got from him last year, when we talked to him and this year in that radio lab radio interview, he, he knows what he wants and he will get it. He mentioned he's taking Harvard business classes to fill out his degree. It's like this kid knows what he wants. And he's aware of the the situation and he's pissed off at the Bruins and this is not going to make it better. So I fully, I fully expect this going to length His his agent, Lewis gross. This is not his first rodeo, Tim. Yeah. And, and I think conviction is the perfect word for Swayman because he, you know, he knows what he wants and he's not willing to compromise on it. But I think a lot of this, most of the issue is coming from gross, whether, you know, positive or negative because the Bruins have paid, at market or even above market for two, you know, top end players in Pasternak and McAvoy, um, and no issues with either of those long term deals, like fair deals. Guys, guys are getting paid, and this is like the fourth or fifth time that Lewis Gross has been involved in a large scale stalemate like this. Obviously with Nylander, but there have been others, and he's like the common denominator here. And so even here's the part that gets interesting: is, is if this isn't interesting enough. Um, Frank reported this morning on his show that the fact that um, they didn't get the eight by eight deal, he said, this is the first we're hearing anything of this. Reportedly, the Bruins offer is actually 7.8 AAV. So it's 200 K less, which is fair enough, right? It's not eight by eight, but the, the, the tone of, um, of agents of the grossest statement is just like, Hey, we're not even anywhere near, near close to this. The fact that they're saying this is like for new star Aria. So, it's just a lot of it's a lot of grandstanding. It's a lot of accusation and finger pointing. It's just ugly. It's really ugly, and it's frustrating to to, to watch and be a part of. So, the part that um, I don't know that does kind of just calm the Bruins' nerves a little bit is that. And again, this is not the long term solution, but you're getting really good play from Corpusalo. He's been arguably. <laughs> the, I know you're going to laugh at this. He's only played uh, two games, um, one win, one overtime loss, but he's allowed three goals and 47 shots. Uh, Ty Anderson has already reported from Montgomery that he's going to start game one. And so you've got at least the stopgap. You've got the short-term solution while you figure this out. But if he's starting games in 2025 as the number one goalie in your in your depth chart, things get really ugly really quick. And I don't. it would probably be, happen much sooner than that. And so I think a, at least to the Bruins' favor, this does just relieve the pressure and, and, and take some of that, hey, we traded all Mark, you're the only guy now. At least Corpus Allo was on the team. He's playing well. It, it alleviates even just incrementally some of the pressure that is on the Bruins camp just a bit. 
Yeah, a little bit until he starts to lose. <laughs> and then the pressure mounts and the fans are calling for Swayman, who's sitting at home watching his team lose, and he's the best goalie potentially on the planet. He could turn out to be. So it's it's a tricky situation. They could roll without him. And Jeremy Jacobs, I think I mentioned this last episode, he's an old school goalie or an old school owner. He will not be pushed around. I was just talking with Mike Johnson on the NHL Network, and Mike was talking about his contract negotiations with Jeremy Jacobs, and he's like, I didn't win. And, you know, they, they are very, very set in their ways when they think a player is worth a certain value. That's where they go. And then it just uh, the bigger question is, what is Jeremy Swayman worth? Where, where do goalie salaries go from here? He's talking about setting the market, always wanting more. I think GMs are starting to wise up on how to build your team. And I've been saying it for years. You don't need to invest a lot of money in a goaltender. You know, a, a decent amount's okay, five, six million. But you don't need to throw $10 million plus at a goaltender to have a, a Stanley Cup team. I know Bobrovsky did it last year and you got the Vasilevskis of the world. But look at the Vegas Golden Knights, you know, Aiden Hill, Logan Thompson. There's plenty of examples of teams not investing in their goaltending situation and winning Stanley Cups. The money's more better spent elsewhere in my eyes. I would rather have a 1A defenseman than a 1A goaltender. I think the impact is bigger for, you know, a puck-moving, fleet-footed defense. Here, would you rather have, if you're the New York Rangers, or the Boston Bruins, for this matter, this is more applicable here, Charlie McAvoy or Jeremy Swayman? If you could pick one player, who would you take? McAvoy. Yeah. Now, I, I think that go if, if you're the Rangers, would you rather have an Adam Fox or an Igor Shosturkin? That's probably tougher, but I would still say Fox. Yeah. And then if you're the Boston Bruins looking right now, you want to set the market, you want to set the market – would you rather have Swayman or Hellebuck, Vasilevsky, Sororkin, Shosturkin, Ottinger, UC Saros? In my eyes, and listen, I love Jeremy Swayman, friend of the show. I would have all those goaltenders over him. Maybe not Sororkin. I know Hellebuck has failed in the playoffs, but there, there's a lot of good goaltenders out there. Yeah, and if, if he's not accepting 8 by 8 that's a problem. Because we get into, like, what Ty Anderson said a few weeks ago, he told us, um, it's not that it's just like he's the third or fifth highest played goaltender like right, right now, but the cap's going up, more guys are going to renew. And in two years, if his contract starts with a 7 or even an 8, it's almost embarrassingly low. When he knows, like, he, he wants to be middle of the pack, from the top five, top eight contracts five years from now if he signs this. So I understand that element of it, but... We get into a question of like, does Swayman walk away out of spite at some point, out of dignity? He's like, you know what? You guys have not acted in good in good faith, and you have thrown me under the bus in front of the media, and I don't want to play for you anymore. And this is really disappointing that it's got to this point, but I can no longer, in in good conscience, be part of this organization. Where even if the money is there, I don't want to be part of this. Not looking at his teammates, but looking at you, Neely, Sweeney. That that leadership group, I don't trust you. No. Um, we're in that territory now. The fact that Freeman's hinting at him formally requesting a trade is just really, really freaky. So I, if I don't know, it, bottom line, do you feel like it's more? Is it whose fault is it? If you point one person, is it Sweeney? Is it Neely? Is it Swayman? Is it Gross? Who do you look to the most and say, how did we get here? Um, well, I. We got here because of the Bruins. I, th I think they could have managed us a little better, even having conversations with Lewis Gross and Sweeney before they traded Allmark and say, hey, let this, let's get this thing wrapped up before we move too much further because this is a pretty important decision for our team. And if, if they didn't have – like they didn't cross their T's and dot their I's when we're here. So at the end, it's their fault. But this, this is Lewis Gross's fingerprints all over it. You know, this is not, like I said, his first rodeo. He's, he's done this before, and he will do it again. And he, I don't, I don't think Jeremy Swayman is at fault here at all. He's getting advice from his team, which is Lewis Gross, and that's what you have to go on. When I was playing, I, I listened to my agent. He's like, you're worth more? Sounds good. Let's, let's go elsewhere. Sign this contract? Sounds good. It's as good as it's going to get. Okay, sign his contract. And then going back to your point about – the salary cap's going up. You know, I, I don't like when players do that because we don't know if it's going up. 
we don't know what two, three, four years is going to bring. And if I'm a GM, that puts me in a difficult spot where I'm negotiating for potential salary cap increases. Look at what happened five or four years ago with COVID when everything was, was flat. And then the GMs just got hammered right? because they were expecting the salary cap to just all of a sudden explode. What if we don't get a new TV deal? What if HRR doesn't increase? And what if we know we're stagnant for a few years or it only increases by a little bit here and there? So you have to negotiate in reality in the here and now. Okay, this is the salary cap. You get a percentage of this, you know, the space. We can't just all of a sudden negotiate for four years down the road. That's not how this works. I'm also thinking about like, just because the Asheville thing is on my mind, an unexpected hurricane in a place where it shouldn't have happened is like, what happens if, ha if this destroys an arena next time? Yeah. Just one arena, one mm -hmm. time that needs to be rebuilt or, or refurnished or whatever, like that's millions, billions, whatever it's going to be. That could impact the cap. That's going to impact the... Um, What's the the uh, our, the number that the, the players pay back to the owners, like all that stuff? Escrow, yeah. Um, escrow, yeah. Like that could happen. You know what I mean? Like it's so unexpected, not to mention a COVID type event. Um, the other thing I just want to mention before we move on, Neely it, is actually, I saw a screenshot of the CBA. It is against the rules for the, the, the team, the organization to lie about negotiations. And so if he didn't offer eight by eight and he, he never formally word for word said yep. that he did right he hinted at it but this is like you're getting into a very dangerous territory where one of these people are gonna have to go you know what i mean either swayman swayman uh, swayman's gone or neely's gone because that's not good and even nylander when we, when he finally came out of his arbitration and wanted to play he released a statement basically saying i wish this had just been over with like, I, I wish I had I've been playing all along. I regret, yeah. He didn't say, say the word regret, but he, he hinted at that. And that only got done when Dulis was able to talk to Newlander directly. They had to, yeah. like, bypass Gross. And Gross allowed it to happen. It's not like it was a, it was a, a secret thing. But he's he, to me, is the one who's messing this all up. Um, and I almost wonder if he got an 8 by 8 offer and didn't tell Swayman about it. You know, I, maybe he was holding out for more. I don't know. And I just hate that we're in this weird guessing game where we're assuming the worst out of everyone. It sucks. Well, again, agents are not allowed to do that. They have to present every offer to the player that they get. So that would also be against the rules. But I don't know. How does this play out for you? I know I've asked you this before, but now we're, we're it's October 1. The season starts this week. Yeah. How does this play out for you? Will we see Jeremy Swayman this year in a Boston Bruins jersey? He has two months to sign. Uh, I'm thinking less <clears> and less <throat> that it's going to be the case. Um, this last 24 hours has really soured the entire situation for me, and I'm – starting to mentally prepare for playing the season without him. And you go get, um, you got Corpus Allo, you go get a $2 million backup somewhere um, or go trade for him or whatever and move on. Uh, and at you, least and you win year. the Stanley Cup. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we put out the bold predictions question, and one of them was uh, Corpus Allo being a, a Vezina candidate. So crazy well, things have happened. Tim, Vezina's a strong, it's a strong word, but the Bruins play – yeah. A very nice type of game for a goaltender. I don't care who their coach is. I don't care what players they have on the ice. They they play a good defensive style of hockey. So Corpus Allo will have a good year. It's yeah. a lot different than the Ottawa Senators. And I know Ottawa has a lot of good defensemen, but Corpus Allo will have a good year. He will. So I, I I firmly believe, and I you know things change. I don't think Swayman sees the ice this year. I, th I think he's done. He's got two months to sign. This is a big pill to swallow. The only way he signs is if he bows down to the Bruins contract offers. And it's an $8 million contract. That's it. Which, according to them, they've never even received. Yeah. And so, well, if, so he can accept that and say, this is what I was waiting for. But then the Bruins have to admit that they lied. You know what I mean? Like, one of them is going to have to eat crow, and I don't see them doing that. So Yeah. Both, both parties seem to be pretty dug in. Yeah, in their stances. But I do think ah, I go back and forth. If he signs, it'll be eight. I, I don't see the Bruins going any higher now based on this just shenanigans the last couple of weeks. They can't. That's that's their number. That's their, that's the hill they're going to die on. All right, moving on. Patrick Laine, feel good story of the year. You know, there there isn't a lot of good things. There are a lot of good things, but just like where you really everybody as a whole is rooting for a player. Usually, you know, the opposite fan base, someone's like, ah, I don't like that guy. I've never liked him. Patrick Laine, what he went through last year with the Columbus Blue Jackets, obviously getting there 
traded from Winnipeg for Pierre-Luc Dubois, not gelling with the coaches, going through some mental issues, going in the player assistance program, trying to work through all of the issues that he's been having, coming back this year, getting traded to the Montreal Canadiens, looking good, looking like he's enjoying the game again, excited to get on the ice, going through training camp, going through all the motions, looking like the player that we know him to be, the goal scorer, the big hulking winger, the sniper that we loved when he first broke into the league with the Winnipeg Jets. He's done. Done for the year. Reports are he will not play another game this year. I don't know what the actual injury is, but it's his knee. It's his right knee. Got hurt in a preseason game coming across the offensive blue line on a power play. Gets stood up by centerman Cedric Paré, Pierre Paré, a journeyman AHL guy, and trying to make a name for himself. Just playing on the PK. Makes a play. Bends Lyonnais' knee sideways. He's done. Let's just start on that first. How gutted do you feel for Patrick Line, Tim? Yeah, it's horrible. Um, it makes me really sad because he's a guy that you want to root for, given all the yeah. The, he's just been very open and vulnerable about mm-hmm. his mental health issues, about you know wanting to to be the new start. Even Fantilli told us like how great of a guy he was, how excited he was for him to to have that opportunity and. Now it's taken away for some stupid, quick little play in a preseason game that didn't matter. And and we have spent so much time in the last month or so talking about Montreal's top six and their potential and and what he could do. And I think 30 goals is his floor if he's healthy all year. And I mean, we haven't officially been told that he's out, but that's the report. He's already hanging out at the rink in crutches. Spirits seem to be okay, but everyone feels for him. And it's just, it sucks that it's happened this way. Didn't have to be that way. No, no, let's look at the play. Because it's, you know, whenever there's a, a high-profile injury, especially in the preseason, especially with a Canadian team, and now Amplify being Patrick Laine, where all the lights are on him, everyone was wanting to see how he was going to respond and play with the Montreal Canadiens. Let's look at the play. So he's doing a typical power play breakout where you, you have the first wave, you drop the puck back to the second wave, who's coming with just an incredible amount of speed. Every team does this breakout. Now, I think it was... I think it was originated with the San Jose Sharks and um, Jay Woodcroft. I think they were the first ones to do it years and years ago. And everybody, it's a copycat league. It works. You're able to gain some speed in the neutral zone. And the reason this works is you have to respect the first wave if you're the PK. If you don't and you anticipate the second wave, the first wave just blows right by you for your breakaways, two-on-ones. We've seen that happen where teams just anticipate the drop pass. So the way teams play it now is you – anticipate the first wave and you try to stand up on the blue line you try to make the second wave dump the puck and then you go back and try to get that dump in puck so the first wave went through pushed all the players back for the toronto maple leafs second wave comes in it's patrick line as he's crossing over the blue line the centerman for the toronto maple leafs cedric Pere. this is a key point he's not a defenseman he is not comfortable and used to attacking someone while he's skating backwards. So he's kind of in a an awkward situation. He's at the blue line. He wants to, you know, make a good impression on the team. He doesn't want to get walked by Patrick Line. So he holds his ground. And I want to make this emphasis perfectly clear. He is not skating forwards. He is skating slightly backwards, almost stationary. He's stopped. Patrick Line is flying at him. Perry just holds his ground. And at the last second, Line dodges to the right, leaves his left leg there, and Pere lunges with his upper body to try to almost tackle or push Patrick Line to the ice. I watched this super slow motion frame by frame. Perry does not move his left leg. He puts more weight on it because he leans in to try to get to Patrick Line. But this is not a case of a guy trying to go straight at someone and sticking out his leg. He didn't do that. There's a reason why he wasn't suspended or he wasn't fine, because I don't think he initiated contact. I don't think he stuck his leg out. And this is going to, I'm going to get ripped for saying this by all the Montreal fans and for a lot of people out there, because everyone's coming at Perry, coming at the NHL, protect our superstars. I don't see it this way. This is a hockey play. Patrick Laine left his leg in a vulnerable position, and it just is a freak accident. Where Pere lunged at him, kept his same line. He didn't extend out, 
and just leaned on line A's shoulder. And in consequence, his knee got caught up and he gets injured. It's a terrible play, but there's, there's, there was no fault of Cedric, Cedric Perry in my eyes. None whatsoever. He stood his ground. He was strong. And line A just came flying into him. And it was like me flying into, I don't want to say a brick wall, but something that's not moving because Perry's got all his weight on that knee. And to me, in my eyes, I watched it very, very slow. He does not move that leg, Tim. So, does that make it Line's fault, or is it just a freak accident? It's a freak accident. Okay, but it definitely does not make it Perry's fault. This is not a penalized play. This and the NHL looked at it, and they wanted to suspend him. Like the, if there was a case or a momentum for someone to be suspended, everybody wanted this guy to be suspended. Because, oh, it's Patrick Laine. Like, this is a dirty play. It wasn't a dirty play, unfortunately. I don't want Laine to get hurt just like the next guy, but you can't throw all this blame on this guy. And P.K. Subban, love the guy. But coming out and saying what he said about, "Ah, no respect for superstars. It's terrible when this happens, this and that. Who cares? This guy didn't target Patrick Laine and say, oh, i got to make a name for myself. Here he comes. I'm going to blow him up. No, Patrick Line skated right towards him, trying to do his own entry, and it was just a, you know, bad, bad accident. It happens. So I think Subban needs to calm down a little bit and just pump the brakes and actually watch the play and analyze it as a player. You don't just all of a sudden pick sides because one guy scored more goals. They're both hockey players. They're both trying to play the game, and it was it was a bad situation. People get hurt. It is what it is. It just happens. This guy's coming back. He hasn't played a full season, Tim, since 2019. It's a tough situation. Oh, I'm yeah. I'm going to get ripped for this. I know it. I absolutely know it. Well, it reminds me of Doc a little bit where it's like, okay, here's here's line A, injured again. He's he's yeah. an injury risk. It's like, no, he's not. Uh, this is a fluke play where, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that it happens. It's not like he just was self-injured or crashed into the boards or just tripped over the blue line and hurt himself. It's a, a bang-bang play. But you mentioned it wasn't targeting, wasn't intent to injure. There was a response to this play from Montreal that – probably was those things what did you think of that again i I, i'm i'm not doing this like i love montreal okay so i'm not just piling on montreal canadians but on the other side of the page cause and effect the way it looks for my team if i'm the montreal canadians okay you took out one of my best players i have to respond and if i'm arbor jack i i have to challenge this guy to a fight i have to do something so i i say hey let's go bro Let's let's fight. The guy doesn't want to fight, obviously. He's not a fighter. He's never been known in a fighter in his career. Jack guy decides we are fighting, and he drops the gloves and continues to pummel this guy into the ice. It's very reminiscent of the Todd Bertuzzi, Steve Moore situation, where Steve Moore took out Marcus Nasland with a hit. Todd Bertuzzi premeditated, went after him. Steve Moore, obviously not going to fight Todd Bertuzzi, Bertuzzi took his glove off, I believe. I can't remember, but attacks him from behind and drives his head into the ice. It's very, very similar. Pere stands up a little more, but he falls on his shoulder. If he dive bombs into the ice, it could have the same result of, I think, Steve Moore had a broken neck or vertebrae or something in that realm. But it's just so similar. And I know it's dramatic to say that. But when you're you're attacking somebody who doesn't want to fight, I get the first two punches. I get it. Okay, you have exacted revenge. This guy's a coward. He doesn't want to stand up for himself, live up to the code. I get that. It's the follow through and the four, the five, the six punches and the driving into the ice. Not forcefully driving into the ice, but, he, you know, he went to – that's what I don't like. That's where it's like, okay, you're crossing the line. And just because Pere gets up and he's not hurt, Arbor Jack guy got a penalty, got kicked out of the game, whatever. You know, George Peros, I – um. I don't know how he does his suspensions. There's no rhyme or reason at all. But if, if I don't know, he gives him a fine, the maximum allowable fine of $3,385.42. As someone who's doing suspensions, as the player's safety czar, you have to judge each individual instance on its own. You, you don't look at the injury, whether, you know, that person broke his neck or didn't that person got a broken concussion, whatever. I don't think the injuries play a part in this because everybody responds differently to getting hit or this and that you have to judge it on the incident, the attack, because this was an attack. 
Perry didn't want to fight. Jack guy knew it. He still went through with it, and he continued to punch him. To me, I'm giving him 15 to 20 games. That's what I'm giving him. I know it sounds crazy. This is a clear-cut case of a guy not wanting to fight, which is fine. It's this third, fourth, fifth punch that really does it for me. And I know it's a lot of games. Maybe maybe 10 games, 7 to 10 is probably where it should have landed, but – it's it's a lot. This is it was too much. It was too much for this situation. So, but he gets he gets a fine, and it sets a precedent now going forward. You can attack someone who doesn't want to fight and completely crush them as long as you keep your glove on. That's it because it's a, it's set. So when someone goes in and does something and you have a, a meeting or an interview like I did for the Louis Erickson thing, you can say, "Look at that preseason Jack guy did the same thing." That guy didn't want to fight. I grabbed him. I punched him five times. He fell to the ice. It's the same situation, George. You have to just give me the fine. Oh, but no, this time the guy got a concussion. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You have to give me this this fine. It, it sets a dangerous precedent moving forward for what's allowed on the ice. So in that situation where the, Perry didn't want to fight Jack High, I mean, you've gotten the revenge assignment before. What are you yep. supposed to do in that situation if he, if he's not engaging with you? You jump him, and we'll see it in a second, but there's a way to jump a guy to make him fight. You face him straight on, and you drop your gloves, and you go, let's go, let's go. And if he doesn't fight, you embarrass him, and then you you know, live the fight another day, and then you say, I'm going to go after somebody else. When I did it, that guy was Phil Kessel. You know what I mean? And there's a way to go about it. If I would have grabbed Phil Kessel, would I have strung him out and beat, beat his doors off? Maybe, maybe not. We never got to that point. But there are ways to go about it to exact revenge. And I, I feel bad for Arbor Jack guy because he's he has to do something. You know, everybody in the rink's watching you. You have to do something. It's the third and fourth punches, Tim, and the fifth punch that I don't like. I get the one and two. That's fine. Leave it there, man. Let him drop to the ice after one or two. Let him drop to the ice. You get your four minutes for double roughing and you go you go on your way. It's it's to follow through. That's that's the part where I don't like it. The guy's down. He obviously doesn't want to fight. You made your point, and you're continuing to punch him. That that's yeah. where it gets a little messy for me. And do you think my last question? Do you think Pare should have had to drop the gloves for this? Like, is it on him a little yeah. bit for not answering for that for that hit? Even though I do. in your eyes it was a clean hit. Yeah, I do. I, I think that's part of the code. You you hurt somebody who was a superstar. You step up, especially if you want to make a name for yourself. Like he, it's not like Paré's small. He's six four, two, fifteen. Like he's a big, big boy. You know, he's from Quebec, so there's things that go along with this. He's not super tough. You know, he played in the Q, or it's just mostly a skill league. The guy put up eighty points his last year in Ramuski. You know, so he's not a fighter, but you should stand up for yourself, even if it's just dropping the gloves. And then falling down. At least, you know, you, you stood up and it just, the situation's done. Like Claude Lemieux did it with Darren McCarty. I know Claude Lemieux is a different situation because he's a fighter, but guys do it all the time. You make a mistake, you hurt somebody, you step up, you fight. That's, that's kind of how hockey works. And if you don't like it, it, it's just, it is what it is, man. It's hockey. Well, that's, a, that's a good transition to the next topic. And the, the final one of the day is um, the situation, I wouldn't call it a situation, the, the incident between the Bruins and the Flyers, where a young kid from on the Bruins, who's actually from my hometown, Hanson, Massachusetts, I didn't, I didn't never met him or anything, but he went to a different school. Um, but he was kind of playing with and messing with Mishkov in a, the preseason game in Philly and getting in his head. And really, like, it wasn't a hockey play. Like, he's in the corner, the puck's gone. And he's, like, jabbing and poking and trying to get a reaction out of him. He knows that he's not going to fight. He's the 18-year-old Russian, all skill, 19, whatever he is. And then who comes over to answer is Sean Couturier, Coots, the captain, standing up for the young kid, letting him and everyone else know that you're not going to mess with him. And the fight itself was, you can barely call it a fight, right? They square up, drop the gloves, throw a couple, someone tumbles, they go down in a heap, and it's over. But that's a great example of, like, answering in the moment, both guys stand, standing up for what they're doing, no one gets hurt, and it doesn't turn into something ugly. And the message was received. And the message was sent. Sean Couturier did it the correct way. That's my skill, young guy. You're not going to you know, mess with him. I'm going to come over. And he didn't give him a chance to not drop his gloves. He comes over. He faces Sweezy dead on, man to man. And he drops his mitts and he starts skating towards him. He's like, we're fighting. We are fighting, whether you like it or not. And Sweezy drops his gloves. I think if Jack guy would have done that to Pere and said, Instead of asking him, you know, let's go, let's go, you got to fight, you got to fight. Just 
face me and drop your gloves. He, he would, you have to at that point, because you're not going to get punched in the face without protecting yourself. So I loved it. Sean Couturier message sent your captain. So Torts was just loving it. Like he was having just like whew, best thing ever to happen to John Tortorella that day. But yeah, beautiful yeah. situation, situation. We got to take care of it. It happened right then and there, and then it'll be done. You know, nothing, it's already old news. It's already over. But now Arbor Jack, all this stuff. They play the first game of the year too, Montreal, Toronto. First game of the year. Ryan Reeves, anybody? Hello, Arbor Jack guy. Let's go. That's what's. That's what happens now. See, it builds now. I love it. It's it's good for hockey, but it could have just been squashed if Perry would have fought him right then and there. But now it's yeah. it's it's going to be like Madison Square Garden, game one, center ice, Jack Guy Reeves. It has to be. That would be awesome. It's going to be, be awesome. awesome. It's going to be that, that whole game could get out of hand if uh, if the other Jack Guy makes the lineup too, and Pizzetta is going to be there. You know, they they are they're going to be ready to go. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention on the Mishkov thing, real quick, who looks outstanding. They, they expect him to basically lap the competition with the rookie class this year. Just very, very good. Um, and there's a great <laughs> quote from Torts who said something along the lines of, I don't have it in front of me, but he said, we're desperate for the kind of plays that only he can make in this lineup, something like that. So like, he's like, I, and I don't want to hold him back. I want to let him do his thing, which is not a very Torch thing to say. You know, he didn't do that with many other stars who have played for him. So uh, I love that comment. We'll see how much it comes true, but there's a lot to be excited about with this Mishkov kid. He's looking at, I would think, uh, 70, 80 points this year. Whoa. Okay. We'll have to save it for the bold predictions, Tim. Everybody does the bold predictions. I don't know if we should do it. I think it's been played up, but we'll have to do something. But all right, that was that was a stressful episode. Lots of serious topics. It's It's interesting this time of year. Usually everybody's gearing up for the start of the season. We still have contract negotiations. There's suspensions and fights and drama it's great nhl's back baby we appreciate the support we hope you guys enjoy the content we'll talk to you guys on thursday get ready for the season cheers everybody